architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try to have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the frontier of architectural thinking. And today I am speaking with Joseph Clark and we are discussing his book Echoes Chamber, Architecture and the Idea of Acoustic Space. Uh, It is a great conversation. We go down a journey on acoustics, uh, acoustical space and acoustical thinking. It has all kinds of ramifications. We discuss war, aesthetics, beauty and the ineffable. Our heroes are Richard Wagner and Le Cabousier and much discussion is deeply personal to both of us. But I hope you will enjoy it too. Here we go. Okay, well, welcome, Joseph. Welcome to Architecture Talk. And thank you for talking to me and uh, sharing your uh, new book with me. So by the way, congratulations. Echoes Chamber, Architecture and the Idea of Acoustic Space, uh, just published by University of Pittsburgh Press. Uh, and it says here, boldly, architectural history uh, even though you're in an art history program uh, at the University of Toronto. So what we, won't, we won't hold uh, that against you. Uh, I'm very excited to have this book in my hand. And it's a, it's a beautifully produced and well-written book, very well researched, a lot of uh, archival work in there. And uh, besides the introduction, it has uh, five chapters Uh, which it seems to me begin roughly in the 18th century and kind of move forward into basically end with the Cabousier, uh, as a lot of things seem to lead up to and and revolve around. So so I'm very intrigued by this because one of the things is, you know, I've just finished writing a monograph on my father's work uh, on, on, on Aditya Prakash and and he was also deeply interested in acoustics. Uh, yeah. And I very briefly, towards the end of the book, try and produce a reading of uh, acoustics as, uh, as, uh, as, as a spatial and form generating uh, concept as other mm-hmm. to the scopic or the eye-centric worldview uh, of post-colonial India. So, th- so I'm very intrigued, and then I thank you for doing an extensive research on this. So why don't we start by w- you introducing us some of the basic concepts? Maybe you want to tell me, tell us about uh, what do you mean by uh, the your main title, you know, Echoes Chamber? Uh, what is this? What is the concept behind this title, and and what is the idea of acoustic space uh, that you are exploring in here? Okay. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm a, what did they say? I'm a long time listener, first time guest. So I, I really appreciate uh, being able to uh, be on the program and, and talk with you about the work that I've been doing now for, I guess, about 10 years in one form or another. Yeah. So, so maybe I should start by telling you how, how I got to this, this project and, and where I came from. I actually uh, grew up in the Midwestern United States and um, when when I was a, a child, I, I sang in choirs in my <laughs> school and at church. Of course. And so I always had a sort of, of musical uh, exposure to music in my life. And then when I went to architecture school, I was on the one hand, I was I was actually really intrigued to discover that so many of my classmates, probably 50 percent of the class had some kind of musical background playing an instrument or being in a band or, or whatever it might be. All right. 
And this, this, in a way, this, this seemed intuitively, it made perfect sense to me because architecture for me, uh, with its combination of kind of mathematical formal uh, issues and also artistic and cultural uh, dimension seemed to kind of resonate with, with both halves of my brain in the same way that music did. But on the other hand, um, so much of what we do in architecture school is, is visual and, and I learned to design by drawing and by looking at images. I learned architectural history through images. And so this was a real kind of question for me, why we seem to kind of marginalize this whole dimension of the physical environment that I would have thought, and, and I, you know, I think to a lot of ordinary people who aren't trained in, in architecture, um, believe is a really crucial to the success or failure of a building, to the, sure. the way that we experience a building. And, and yet for um, so somewhere along the line in architectural training, I think we, we kind of lose our ability to understand acoustics. Um, for, for most architects, um, in my experience, acoustics is sort of cloaked in mystery. It's this field that the only way we could really engage it in a rigorous way is through equations, which are so complex that most of us uh, architects, um, we need an engineer to come in and solve them for us. That's right. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a consultant's so, job, not, not really a design job. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the question for me was to think about how this state of affairs came about, and yeah. what um, if there was a history to architects' efforts to conceptualize sound as an architectural problem. So, so answer that first part for us first. What? Why are we so scopically dominated and not acoustically in in the modern regime? Well, the the media that we use to design and the media that we use to study architecture are, are visual. I think it's as simple as that. Um, we why, learn why did it come, come out that way? I mean, what were the biases at play in the rise of professional professionalism, let's just say, uh, that uh, enforced that? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of the, the narratives that we have go back to the early modern period, to the rise of printing books, um, to the development of, of modern uh, drawing techniques and techniques of, of projection mm -hmm. um, that establish architectural expertise as an expertise manipulating images. And this is how we, you know, this is how we, we learn to design. This is how I teach architectural history. And of course, I teach it by showing my students pictures of buildings that many right. of which they will, they may never have a chance to visit in their lives, but they learn what they look like. Right, right, and we assume that that means they've learned about uh, the building. Mm -hmm. So our discipline is is completely about images. Um, architects don't. Most architects don't produce buildings. They produce drawings of buildings That's right. um, that somebody right. else will go and possibly go and build. So our discipline it's it's visual through and through, yeah, um, and yeah. it has been for hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So go on. So so echoes chamber. So you are writing about the other history of our discipline, those who uh, look at architecture through sound. Yes, that's right. This is, so in some ways, this is kind of the, the secret history of <laughs> the uh, minority of architects. Admittedly, it's a minority of, yeah. of Western architects, I should say, yeah. um, who have tried to, and with varying degrees of success, and some of them, I have to say, didn't succeed, but, that, but we can still learn a lot from them. We can learn from failure. Um, and some of them did succeed in trying to make sense of um, sound spatially. The book, I sort of frame it in terms of uh, Marshall McLuhan, um, the, yeah, of course, the great um, yeah. Canadian, yes, the great Canadian media philosopher who actually developed the term, coined the term acoustic space. And this was one of his, for a while, this was one of his key words that he repeated over and over and over again okay. um, to describe how he envisioned that, um, and of course, this has been subject to so many critiques, and, uh, but his argument was that uh, Western culture, at least since the Renaissance, had been primarily structured around visual space, that the way that we communicate, the way that we orient ourselves in the world had been primarily visual. Mm -hmm. And that was based on the predominance of printed books, images, the linear perspective, um, newspapers, and so forth. In the 
really st starting in the 20th century with the rise of radio. This was for him the defining transition. The, the, the rise of radio really made, made modern mass media and politics uh, possible. And this had changed everything for him because uh, suddenly people were beginning to communicate, to, to understand their relationship to society and to one another in terms of acoustic media. And, and for him, this reflected a, a like profound transition in the nature of our senses and in the nature of our society. It was, it was connected to the demand for more interactive and participatory kinds of media. And we can think today of social media. It was connected to the sense that the world had, had shrunk that every place was was not that far from every other place. Right. We're we're all suddenly we feel like we're all connected all the time. Um, so what did he mean was, and, specifically by acoustic space? What was his, in a sense, definition, McLuhan's? Well, uh, he provided about a hundred different definitions. Um, yeah. And the problem with McLuhan is that he would try to relate every every possible phenomenon of the contemporary world back to acoustic space, sometimes in untenable ways. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he was he was trying to uh, connect, and I think in a in a pretty profound way, the way that our senses work and our, our auditory sensation with some of the most profound problems that we we face in the in the contemporary world, um, how we communicate with one another, how we learn to, to listen to one another. For McLuhan, the condition of acoustic space was also characterized by political tribalism. And this is something that I think resonates with us all today. For him, it was as though we suddenly, we, we were all, all humans are living in a single room, in a single enormous interior environment in which everybody can hear everybody else. And so the Twitter sphere is still a part of McLuhan Acoustic space, would you argue? He, oh, yes. He was writing about this 50 years ago. Yeah. Right. right, and, right. and this is this is a new condition that's exhilarating. And it's also terrifying if we don't learn how to adapt to it. Right. Um, and so. But McLuhan you have is, a different title for this, right? I mean, you're calling it echoes chamber. What's the difference between acoustic space and an echoes chamber? An echo chamber is both a uh, room where we we hear everything we have this sort of deafening uh, sound of of our own voices and and of, of everybody's voices simultaneously and echo is also a, a mythological figure so i actually go back to um to ovid to ovid's metamorphoses and echo the nymph who is condemned by by the goddess uh, juno to mm -hmm. simply repeat what other people say and so echo as a phenomenon that that philosophers and writers have speculated about for hundreds of years, but that has also been an inspiration for, um, for architects since, at least since the Enlightenment. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, you know, you spend a fair amount of time on, uh, on the 18th and 19th century and, you know, dealing with the complexities of how to represent acoustic qualities and the debates and discussions around, you know, whether or not uh, sound can be represented in the same way that light can be represented through reflective surfaces and so on and so forth. One part of your book seems to crystallize around the question of the design uh, of the auditorium. Uh, and in particular, uh, Richard Wagner's attempt to make a complete work of art, you know, Gesamtkunstwerk. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the design of his uh, theaters uh, in Germany and, and his idea that, you know, a vogue could be connected to the nation or the people could be connected to the nation. And the idea of the nation, I think, can be precipitated via the production of a Gesamtkunstwerk, right? Or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the significance of the theater in uh, uh, kind of Wagner's view of, of things. Yes, absolutely. I do spend a lot of time in this book writing about theaters and opera houses and other kinds of auditoria, not because I wanted to write a kind of typological history of the theater building, um, but simply because these are the buildings that in the 18th and 19th centuries, clients really cared about acoustics and would be willing to spend money for the architect to, to undertake the kind of, of acoustic research um, to think about sound as an architectural problem. But yes, I mean, in many ways, this culminates in the theater that the composer uh, Richard Wagner built in 
Bayreuth, Germany, in, in, in Bavaria in the uh, 1870s for the staging of his operas. Mm-hmm. And this was a, a really significant building for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, just the, the very fact that a composer was creating a building for his own works. I mean, Wagner was, among other things, not only a composer, but a great entrepreneur and businessman and uh, oh. expert in branding to uh-huh. figure out how to raise the money to build this thing <laughs> only for the production of his own site-specific operas, which were only meant to be performed. At least his final uh, work, Parsifal, was, was meant to be only performed in this one theater. <laughs> um, so, so that's remarkable. And it is a very innovative building that actually draws on a whole a long discourse of, of European um, theater architecture that we can go back to uh, the 18th century. We could look at uh, uh, Ledoux's uh, theater in Besançon, um, Schinkel's theaters in Berlin, um, and Gottfried Zemper's various designs um, for theaters. Um, and this all fed in to and and the also the Paris Opera, which was um, in the nineteenth for much of the nineteenth century, the kind of center of innovative theater design and theatrical spectacle. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of this fed into Wagner's uh, theater design. But weirdly, uh, and this this theater in Bavaria still exists, and you can go and see it. Um, weirdly, architectural historians have kind of not registered that this is a this is a central site of of modern culture, um, where a new kind of mass spectacle was produced for the first time. Um, a lot of um, writers in film and media studies are, are you, obsessed you, with Wagner's theater because of its its innovative architecture. Right. And architectural historians haven't really caught up. So what I try to do is talk about the history of the theater um, and specifically its acoustic conception. And in fact, the, the architect who designed it, who is this totally obscure, um, completely forgotten architect named Otto Bruchwald, uh, was actually an acoustic expert. And that's the reason that Wagner brought him on to design this project. So it's a theater designed not so much around vision, but around listening. Yeah, and you note that Wagner originally worked with Zempa and uh, Zempa, Gottfried Zempa was his architect, but then he dropped him uh, and moved on to this other architect because he felt that he was, he could work more directly with him to produce this complete work. Yeah, it was partly that um, that uh, Bruchwald was more malleable than, than Zemper. Zemper had strong <laughs> ideas yeah, and Zemper yeah. was, a, was a real artist. He was, a, he was a, an artist and a theorist and a thinker. Yeah. And he had his vision for what a great theater should be. Yeah. And Wagner, uh, had an enormous ego of his own, and he had his idea of what a theater should be. It was so. It was the classic story of uh, of uh, clashing egos. And so Ruth let's let's, let's younger... yeah. So let's dive a little bit deeper okay. into uh, into Wagner's vision. I mean, what was the vision, and why was this theater in this particular way so important for him? Well, it did have something to do with, as you mentioned before, with nationalism. Right. Um, so over the course of the 19th century, uh, for most of the century, Germany was not one country. As, as we know, it was a bunch of smaller countries um, which were struggling to unify. And there was a, mo- a nationalist movement that the, uh, the German romantics had been part of trying to kind of build a unified uh, culture and um, Schiller actually said that when Germany has a, a theater culture, a national theater culture of its own, then it will truly become a nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so Wagner was um, part of this movement to create a literary and musical culture uh, for Germany that could sort of bring the German nation into being. Now, by the time that he actually managed to build his theater, there already the German nation had already come into being and not through this... Uh, nice story of, of um, the uh, development of culture, but through war, through the uh, Prussian victory over the French in 1871. But a big part of what Wagner was trying to do was to create a German national culture, which was a very progressive goal in the context of the 19th century. When Today, when we, th- we talk about nationalism, um, I think that it has a different valence. And of course, we look, we're looking back through the um, history of the Second World War and, and Nazism. Um, but in the 19th century, this was actually the progressive political position to support a unified uh, nation. Um, so but is, there a, was, is there a sort of continuity there between 
the unity of all the arts and the unity of the nation? I mean, is that a kind of a homology he was trying to produce or how was this supposed to work? Yeah, I think it, I think it absolutely is because he, he writes about his idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk the total work of art, as though the arts are our people, our, our sisters who come together and work together for a common purpose. So I think that was an implicit analogy. Implicit or explicit? Well, I don't know. I think we, we, we can go back to his writings and see. I, I, I don't think he spelled it out quite that explicitly, but um, I, I definitely think that it's there. But what's interesting is how over the course of his career, his development as a composer, and over the course of his experiences in German society, and he was actually involved, along with Zemper, he was involved in the failed revolutions of 1848 and 1849. They were both living in, in Dresden, where uh, Zemper was, or uh, Wagner was the conductor of the orchestra. Yeah. And they participated in this uprising right. that uh, that didn't succeed. And so then they were both exiled. And so this is when Zemper went to London and yeah. was was involved in the, actually in the great exhibition in London. Wagner was exiled and he lived for, in Switzerland for a while. And um, his view of this, this total work of art began to change and he became more drawn to the philosophy of Schopenhauer, uh, moving away from, the philosoph from Hegel's idealist philosophy and more into the philosophy of, of Schopenhauer, which was more uh, often seen as a more pessimistic philosophy, at least pessimistic towards the possibility of political transformation through through culture. His style of composing began to change also, and the sound of his music became more important to the way that his, his operas or his music dramas were conceived. Wagner was also really interested in the production of new timbres or new, new, new sounds, um, not simply through, through the traditional musical, European musical means of, of melody and harmony, these Kind of conventional categories, um, but even inventing new kinds of instruments um, that would produce different sounds. So Wagner was a great admirer of um, Adolf Sax, who was the um, instrument maker in, in Paris, um, who was inventing new, um, new instruments, and Wagner developed some new instruments of his own. Um, and so one of his motivations in building his own theater was to have a building where he could control every dimension of the production, but especially the sound and the, the acoustic quality of it. So let's talk about a little bit about that, because you spend a lot of time on the section, on the, on the design of the orchestra pit, right? I mean, that yes. seems to be an important innovation for Wagner and at that time. You know, why was that such a important thing. Well, this has been one of one of the most celebrated aspects of Wagner's theater is the sunken orchestra pit. So when you're sitting in this in this theater watching a production, the orchestra is completely out of sight. You don't see you never see the musicians. Um, in fact, I have a, a photograph I sometimes show of um, production that where it's taken from an angle so you can see the musicians in the orchestra and you can see the spectators in the audience and the spectators are all you know dressed to the nines with with the gowns and tuxedos mm -hmm. and the the musicians are wearing t-shirts and shorts because they know that nobody's ever going to see them um, <laughs> because they're completely invisible right. um, so what wagner wanted to do and this is very interesting he wanted you to hear music and not be able to place where it was coming from and so your attention would be entirely on the visual scene of the stage and your brain would process the music that you were hearing simply as the background to the visual scene on stage. And so this is really like a, a forerunner of um, cinema and the way that uh, fi uh, film films use music to sometimes in a rather manipulative way to make us feel emotions, to change the way that we perceive a scene. But we almost, we, when we're watching a movie, we don't always even notice the music consciously. It's right. there subliminally. Uh, changing our perception of the scene. So he was involved in this uh, kind of trying to re-engineer our, our sensory perception, our audiovisual perception in a fundamental way. Right, right. And later on, you know, I'm not sure how much you, you worked on that, but, you know, Cabuzier also invents this idea of the, uh, what's it called, the, the magic box, which is also kind of a acoustic chamber that it never built but he had this hmm. idea of the magic box, uh, which would be a kind of a sound device, sound theater performance space 
which kind of disappears. Uh, Cor- yeah. Corbusier was was very influenced by by Wagner initially as a young man. He actually um, read about Wagner. He was he was really into music when he was growing up. In, in fact, his mother was a, a piano teacher, and his his brother was a was a musician. Um, yeah, I mean the story goes that then, uh, yeah that you know they always thought that Corbusier's brother Albert was the really cool kid because he was a yes. musician, and Corbusier <laughs> was this sort of lesser kid. <laughs> and they want they wanted Albert to be a concert violinist, yes, and yes, and yes. apparently they pushed him so hard to practice his violin that he actually injured his arm, and so he he had to be so he became a, a composer and a music teacher, and so so Corbusier never had that musical training, but he kind of imbibed uh, his interest in music as as a young man, and he was very taken with Wagner as a lot of Europeans were at that time. Um, around the turn of the century. When he was in, living in Vienna, he went to Wagner operas and we have correspondence. He would write back home to his parents and just gush over the, the you know, B- Wagnerian operas about these big emotions uh, yeah. acted out on stage. And, and he was really into these productions. So yeah, that was yeah. a major influence on him. You know, later on, we, you know, he comes to Ronchamp and of course these his idea of acoustic and ineffable space and, and all that. But how are these acoustic ideas played out in Cabuzia's early work between the wars, let's say? So like in his purest period, he was he was very enthusiastic about communication technology and about the potential for architecture to contribute to the, the building of a new mass society and mass politics. So he did a number of designs for projects that involved acoustics, although they were almost all competition entries that were not selected in the end. So this is why they're not better known, but um, maybe the most famous one is his design for the Palace of the League of Nations in Geneva, which was in, I think, 1927, which features, of course, a huge um, hall for the, the delegates to meet in. And he and and this was with his cousin Pierre Genre. They uh, they argued that the reason the jury should pick their design was because they worked with an acoustic consultant. This was something very innovative to bring in a um, an in, a trained engineer to consult about acoustics, and their design was completely designed around audibility and making the voices of the delegates audible without the need for electric amplification. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not clear that it actually would have worked, but this was their theory. And they, they actually did bring in um, an acoustician named Gustave Lyon, who actually also designed a, a concert hall in Paris during this period, which is sort of, if you look, if you compare the Corbusier League of Nations design and the Lyon concert hall, they look exactly the same. Um, so it was the same basic principle. Uh, so he did that project and they didn't win, but uh, actually that was one of the reasons behind the formation of the of SIAM, the International Congress of, of Modern Architecture, which formed after that project was uh, rejected because modernist architects around Europe were so irate that the jury um, had not give picked Corbusier to design the League of Nations. So actually, so, this, so I um, mean, one, one of the things that occurs to me here again is, so there is a Wagner trying to produce the idea of the nation. Mm-hmm. through sound and a certain sort of acoustic experience. And now here is Cabusier trying to produce the idea of the super nation, you know, if that's what the League of Nations is, right? Uh, and with, again, a, a kind of an acoustic argument at its heart. Exactly, uh, yeah. So, so there's an idea that modern politics, modern diplomacy is acoustic in nature. And, and, and I'm also thinking of uh, the mundanium and the sort of uh, inf- Museum of Infinite Growth, which becomes the Museum of Knowledge later on, and we'll come to that, was supposed to be the idea that, you know, we can quickly, quickly connecting people and having people talk to each other was considered to be a necessary part of producing the super nation, right? Yes. I mean, it's a kind of a secularized Tower of Babel idea, is it? Is it not? Uh, it, absolutely. And actually, um, Corbusier, in his writing about his League of Nations design, he compares it to the Tower of Babel, uh, oh, wow. which you would think yeah. would which you would think would be a, a negative example to compare it to. But he he kind of embraces this. This is going to be the new Tower of Babel that's that's now built with the help of an engineer. And so this this time we're going to get it right. 
right, and right, we'll be able right. to bring all nations together, people speaking in different languages, but we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to understand each other and we'll all be able to communicate. The production of the modern nation and inter modern international diplomacy is absolutely connected to acoustic uh, media. And we should also say, uh, famously, um, Albert Speer said that it was the radio and the loudspeaker that made the rise of Hitler possible. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, and that, and, that, and uh, Speer would be in a position to know, having having designed the Nazi rally grounds in Nuremberg. So, um, so this is absolutely central to to the to the construction of of the nation. Right, right. In a sense, through amplification and translation, the expectation is that the uh, misunderstandings produced by the dispersal of languages uh, 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 which were resulted because of the expulsion of the people supposedly um, around the Babel would, could be nullified by acoustics, right? I mean, if right. misunderstanding was the cause of war, then all you needed was good acoustics and good communication to solve the problem of war, which is an idea which hasn't gone away. Many people would think that, you know, if you could just talk, sit down and talk and clearly understand each other, everything would be okay. Right. If we can fix our communication, I mean, we talk about communication problems as the, the source of the problem in our, in our politics, in our interpersonal relationships, we need to communicate better. Yeah, we, we, we project all of our problems into communication. Yeah, let's just sit and talk about it, is, is, the, is the mantra. Yeah. Uh, but uh, after the Second World War, uh, Cabousier sort of transforms this acoustic uh, character or acoustic idea of acoustic space into something a bit more uh, quizzical or ineffable, particularly around his design of Grand Champ. Does he not? Yes. And um, the project that people know from Corbusier that involves acoustics is the Phillips Pavilion. So this is from 1958, right. the, of course, the world's first World's yeah. Fair after, after World War II, relatively small pavilion yeah. for the Phillips Electronics Company, but containing this kind of multimedia spectacle that was designed by Corbusier and in working along with the composer Edgar Varese mm -hmm. and Yanis Senakis, who was both an architect and a composer. But actually, many of the ideas behind the Phillips Pavilion, Corbusier actually developed a couple of years earlier for Ronchamp. Uh -huh. And he wasn't able to, to fully implement them in that project um, for reasons we can talk about. And so they wound up in sort of migrating to the Phillips Pavilion project instead. But yeah, so this is connected in partly with his mysterious text on acoustic space, this little essay that he wrote in the mid 40s yeah. about the aesthetic experience of architecture as a static event yes. of yes. a kind of it's... spiritual feeling of the consonance between a, a building and the site and the person experiencing it which he describes in acoustic terms. It's almost as though the building is making a sound and it, it echoes through the landscape and comes back and you perceive this, this consonance um, in that sound. So it goes from this ultra technologized communication, therefore solve all the world's problems claim around the League of Nations and the Palace of the Soviets into this something that's more ineffable and spiritual and kind of has almost mystical qualities, right? I mean, why? How, how did that happen? That, why, why do you think he sort of, that transformation took place in Cabusier's oof? It, it does seem like a dramatic transformation. I think in some ways, um, the the seeds of, of this later idea were, were already there. If you look closely, there's a the scholar uh, Christopher Pearson wrote wrote an article about this. If you if you actually look at some of his writings, even from the um, the twenties and even even earlier, where he mentions sound, for example, in his when he went to Greece to visit the Parthenon in his diaries, he talks about seeing the Parthenon as 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 a having a kind of acoustic quality. He describes it to hearing a, a the sound of a trumpet, and there's something about the relationship of the Parthenon and the Acropolis in this site in in the landscape that it 
catalyzed a, a sort of a aesthetic reaction that he he suddenly had. So I don't think it was entirely new in the 1940s, but he definitely seems to have felt that acoustic, by that point, that acoustics was no longer just purely a kind of technical engineering problem to be solved, but but was trying to apply it in a different way to his formal conception of architecture. And this is something that that some you know, observers of Le Corbusier were really freaked out by. Uh, right. uh, James Sterling wrote that that famous uh, uh, article after about the chapel of Ronchamp, really skeptical that this could be a direction for architecture. It seemed like Corbusier had kind of given up on some of the basic tenets of of the the modern project with this right. uh, this building. Yeah, rationalism in particular was something we. It came down upon. So, so, so the, let's move to the Phillips Pavilion now, which is also a brilliant, uh, you know, not brilliant, or at least fascinating project. Uh, and uh, amazing music of uh, Edgar Verez, right? Yes. Well, yeah, but, but this is what's interesting that actually Corbusier wanted to bring Verez into the Ronchamp project. He did. Um, so this is what this is in fact where it started. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. in in Corbusier's designs for Ronchamp, and the project took about five years to design. So it was for a long time he was producing drawings and models of this chapel. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look, you will see in many of these drawings this um, sort of metal grid structure that was to be built next to the chapel, next to the entrance of the chapel. Mm-hmm. And this was, Le Corbusier called this a company lay. So this was like a bell tower. It's mm-hmm. not actually a tower, but c- conceptually that was its function. And he would have loudspeakers mounted on this grid mm-hmm. and this kind of framework. And they would play experimental music at different times of the day. Uh-huh. And this would be his modern interpretation of bells. In fact, originally he wanted to have just the re- recorded sounds of bells. Right. Um, but then, um, then he seems to have gotten more ambitious and he wanted to bring a composer in. He wrote a letter to Edgar Varez and invited him to participate in the project and described the kind of music that he wanted Varez to create for Ronchamp. He said it, would, it, would, it could juxtapose uh, liturgical music of the past with uh, modern sounds that would be violent and impersonal. Oh. Um, so he seems to have had in mind this kind of, of like sonic montage of, of traditional church music and jarring violent new sounds that would, would produce a kind of, we would, what we would now call sound art. I mean, that, that term didn't exist then, but it would right. be the sound installation that would completely transform the way you experience this chapel. So now, you know, we, we, we go to Ronchamp, we make our, as, as architects, we make our pilgrimage to Ronchamp and uh-huh. it's, it's quiet and we sort of meditate in this contemplative silence. Sure. Um, but that's not actually what he wanted at all. <laughs> um, and it's, so that's what's so fascinating. Yeah, that so, is fascinating, yeah. So they I, didn't I, build that. Yeah. As, Why as didn't know. they build it? Why did? The best answer is that the, um, the Vatican uh, cracked down on this, uh, this project by the French Dominicans to introduce more modern art and modern music into the Catholic Church. So it was these these very progressive French Dominicans who had invited Corbusier to to design the project in the first place. And but they were the the Pope kind of had his eye on them and was trying to trying to hold them in 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 check. And as the Ronchamp project went along, the the Pope was continuing to, to crack down further. And eventually the chapel was built, but they had to scale back some of the other ambitions. Now, but in La Tourette, Cabousier put this huge, dramatically placed bell on top of the chapel, right? I mean, in the, that does have uh, a, a big bell, doesn't it? It does. It does. And originally he wanted to have a, a, an enormous loudspeaker on top of the church oh. that would that would play some kind of avant-garde sound. I'm not sure whether it was to play the sound of like monks chanting or, or what it would be. Imagine so, Edgar Varese going over the landscape of La Tourette. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be, wouldn't quite that be crazy? Insane? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> With all yeah, this. and I mean, if you think about it, this was the same period, roughly, when John Cage was. Um, was doing his pieces four minutes and 33 seconds. Yeah. 
this was the period when European uh, composers, Verez, but also um, Stockhausen was coming on the scene and beginning to think about uh, designing a concert spatially to have sound coming from multiple locations. Um, Zinakis, who was who was actually an architect working in Le Corbusier's office at the time, um, but then after that left yeah. to become a composer, was also starting to think spatially about um, composing music. So Le Corbusier was was on the edge of something. He was on the cutting edge, and that um, stuff is still cutting edge, man. I mean, you listen to Verez or Zinakis, it's still out there. It is way out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about the Brussels Pavilion. Now, you know, Zanakis basically designed it. It was supposed to be like a stomach. So is, is, is Zanakis like a realization, final realization of this uh, acoustic vision? Yeah, in some ways you could say that. I mean, I think Le Corbusier and Zanakis also had, shall we say, creative differences. And this yeah, is yeah. why right after that project, Zanakis... Corbusier fired Zanakis, basically. They right, felt yeah, that they yeah. couldn't work together anymore. But yeah, in many ways, I mean, Zanakis has sort of was finally able to realize some of these ambitions that Corbusier had. You know, what, what's also interesting about the, the Philips Pavilion is, uh, is the client, Philip. So this was an electronics company, still is a company that makes audio equipment. They, in addition to making radios and, and microphones, they were also in the mid 20th century, they were also starting to design systems for modifying the acoustics of architectural spaces. Mm -hmm. So particularly concert halls and auditoria that had acoustic problems. They would install systems of hidden microphones and loudspeakers that could change the acoustics of the space in real time. So for example, if the, if the hall didn't have enough reverberation, you could install this system. This it was very cutting edge, and it would it would artificial it would simulate more reverberation, but it would sound just like natural, like it was coming from the building. Mm-hmm. So they, in fact, they in- installed this system at La Scala, the the famous opera house in Milan. Um, so this was their great triumph. But the problem with it was that when the system was working well, you didn't notice it. And especially like it, uh, La Scala was didn't want to publicize that they had installed this <laughs> electronic system because this right, would right. the whole yeah. mythos of of the perfect acoustics of their opera house would be ruined. Right, right, so right. Phillips had developed this amazing technology and uh, didn't have any way really to publicize it. And so that's why they wanted to create a World's Fair pavilion where they could show off their audio technology and and specifically their ability to alter the acoustics of a room. And so this was the point of the, this was the intention with the Phillips Pavilion to have a, a space where they could showcase their acoustic equipment. So uh, the Phillips Pavilion was designed to uh, like I know it had speakers everywhere, right? It was completely black and there were all these weird Cabuzier images uh, moving across the surface and the surfaces yes. were bent in every direction. So it must have been, uh, you know, it was an eight and a half minute experience, right? That you went in and out of, uh, of, the, of the stomach of Philip's pavilion. So uh, yeah. what was the experience supposed to... Uh, and gender in the viewer. Do you have a sense? Well, Le Corbusier came up with the idea that it would be a stomach. So he developed the initial stomach-shaped plan, and then he sort of handed that off to Zinakis to yeah. work out the, the actual form with these hyperbolic paraboloids. Right. Um, but if we take the metaphor seriously, then you were supposed to be digested. You were supposed to be ingested <laughs> into this building. And what happens in the stomach? You sort of were churned around in these juices that that break you down (laughs) um, and then send you out the other side. So Corbusier was, I think, less interested in the design, the architectural design of the pavilion, because he was happy to just, he was busy with Chandigarh at this point. So he was happy to let Zinakis, you know, work out the the building form. But he was very interested in the images and this audiovisual program of the pavilion. So he picked out from his archive of, of images, which was vast, a, a kind of sequence of, of images that, that he composed, you know, poetically to tell. I, I think it's a, it's a sort of narrative of the story of, of humanity. Yeah, um, with the Kabuzi coming cul- out. And, which culminates, of course, in <laughs> Chandigarh. And this, this, 
the, the, yes, the story culminates in Le Corbusier's buildings and of his designs course, for, for, course, for, for cities. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Um, and then he brought in uh, Edgar Varez to finally got the chance to collaborate with him. He had been met Varez decades earlier and was was really fascinated with his music and and thought that he was you know the the most visionary composer and had been wanting a chance for the two of them to work together. And so finally finally it happened. And and Varez composed this music that actually sounds a lot like Corbusier's description of what he wanted the Ronchamp installation to sound like with kind of ju- it's a sort of collage of sort of snippets of, of older Western music and, and bells and, and chanting with the sound of, of a jet engine and, and other kinds of, of modern synthesized noises. Right. So as we move to the end over here, last question, the, the thought that occurs to me, it's, this is uh, the Brussels pavilion in a sense was Cabuzier's bearer. Uh, I mean, his Gesamtkunstwerk, right? I mean, it was his uh, his uh, operatic moment. Uh, yeah. is, is that a reasonable, you know, is that like, that's what Wagner did with, with Zampa and his architect. Uh, and this is me with my Varez uh, doing my, 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 you know, 1950s version of it. They're about 100 years apart, aren't they? Yeah. Well, absolutely, but they they had probably similarly sized egos. Of course. Um, so, <laughs> but but I think I think so. I think it is a Gesamtkunstwerk. But the difference is that Wagner's Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk was really his total vision. I mean, he wanted to control every dimension of the production. He did control every dimension of it, and he wanted every dimension of it to fit together and complement one another basically seamlessly. So it's almost impossible to tell where the music ends and the set design begins and where the, 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 the dramatic text, the libretto ends and the, and the costumes begin. With Corbusier, it's a bit different because he was more comfortable with, I mean, he was actually had sort of internalized the critique of Wagner that, that was already part of European culture by this point. Um, and he was more comfortable with the different dimensions, the different tracks of the production, if you will, the audio and the visual, um, being more in tension with one another. Right. And so he, and, and, and plus he was not a composer himself and he, he understood this, although he loved music, he didn't know how to compose. Right. So he was comfortable working with Varese and giving Varese a pretty high level of autonomy. Right. And in fact, apparently, I don't know whether this is true, but he, he says that he and Varese they agreed on the total length of the the so-called poem electronique, yeah. um, but they didn't coordinate it at all, and so right. it was just fortuitously. So if the images and the sound seem to kind of link up at certain points, that's totally coincidental. Right, we're told. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, you know, you can think of uh, the opera theater also as like being inside a stomach, uh, and then you sort of pass through. It's like stomach to stomach. And I remember uh, Cabuzier referred to the assembly halls, the actual chambers in the Chandigarh assembly building that has two chambers as stomachs. Uh, really? Yes, yes. He calls them stomachs. Uh, well, there, there are connections between those projects because um, he also brought on one of the Philips engineers that he worked with for the World's Fair Pavilion right. um, to advise him on the acoustics of the Chandigarh um, assembly halls. Yes, and so it's, it's got those metal panels all, all around, and I wonder if yeah, that must have come. That right, which are sort of like abstracted clouds, isn't that the idea? Well, it has two sets. It has one set of uh, square black panels all around, mm. and then it has those abstracted clouds. So it has two levels of acoustic treatment. I see, right, uh, right, right. Uh, so it's an interest, It's an interesting journey from the the League of Nations design right. to the Chandigarh uh, assembly. I don't spend a lot of time in the book on on, on Chandigarh, but but actually, I think I, I that would be an interesting comparison to make uh, because in the early project in the League of Nations, Corbusier deliberately avoided any kind of electroacoustics. There were no microphone or loudspeakers. Right. The building itself was a kind of loudspeaker, and it would it would. Uh, project sound. Right. 
at Chandigarh, it's it was completely electronically mediated. There would be a microphone at every seat, and there would be loudspeakers, and um, the the entire uh, kind of idea of the acoustic program was different. Right. Well. Joseph, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And some of the point we'll also talk, he, he also designed an audiovisual training center in Chandigarh, which I think mm-hmm. is also somehow connected to that. But maybe we'll pick that up in another conversation. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.